Insights and profound thoughts about uh, the people of Ladakh, their livelihoods, their sense of place, and also climate change and how it affects their lives. Cynthia grew up in Minnesota, and that's also where she completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Minnesota in geography. So I'm really excited that Cynthia is a, a geographer. She later went on to pursue a master's in science in international development with a focus on community development. A mountaineer who found herself intrigued by the people who depend on the Himalayan landscape for their livelihoods. She rejected the agendas of international development organizations and instead founded her own nonprofit called Health, uh, which also stands for Health, Environment, and Literacy in the Himalayas. So since 1989, she's been working with Ladakis in cooperation and collaboration and partnership with them. She's a person who took her education into the real world, and so I think she, off she offers us a lot of lessons on how to use one's education as a springboard for doing really wonderful things in the world. She's received a number of recognition recognitions for her work, in uh, 2006, she received the Public Service Award of the Bellin Foundation, and that's based in Montreal, Quebec. And her work and contributions in North India is also the subject of a documentary film, which is called The Magic Mountain. And I just want to say that her work is also very relevant to a number of people on campus, both faculty and students, and the issues and concerns that she will be addressing tonight are at the center or heart of our new minor in mountain studies. So some of you might be interested in pursuing this minor. We have some descriptions of the program in the back. And if you have any questions, you can talk to myself or the co-advisor of the minor in mountain studies, Dr. Ulrich Kamp, who's also <coughs> in geography. So we hope that you find that of interest in, and seek us out for more information. So without further ado, it's a wonder, wonderful opportunity to welcome Cynthia to the, the front. Please extend the welcome. Thank you very much, and it's wonderful to be here. I'm not going to turn it on because now I'm going to go sit back down because actually we've got the movie and we're just going to show the first five minutes of it because I think better than anything else it could describe where I live and what I do.
Cynthia Hunt first traveled to the Himalaya 20 years ago as a mountaineer. She fell in love with the people in the place, and she stayed. Here you are! Julia <laughs> The VEC chair and the head of the Women's Committee, <laughs> and my buddy. In 1989, she founded a non-government organization she calls Health Inc., which stands for Health, Environment and Literacy in the Himalaya. Okay, like they don't come health clinic first trimester. What began as a passion for the mountains is now a full-time job implementing much-needed health education in the region of northwest India called Ladakh. Even though Ladakhis may want a better future, the challenge of introducing new ideas to an ancient society can be as steep and arduous as the trails that link the villages. This is Cynthia's home. Ladakh is a former Buddhist kingdom that lies in the Muslim state of Jammu and Kashmir within the predominantly Hindu nation of India. Besides these political complexities, geography and climate pose even greater obstacles to modernization. Ladakh is one of the highest and driest inhabited places on earth. Centuries ago, when Silk Road caravans crossed Central Asia, they brought not only material riches to Ladakh, but also new ideas. The leisurely gait of pack animals dictated the rhythms of life and the rate of progress. When Ladakh opened its doors to the west in 1974, the pace quickened. Globalization swept in like a tsunami wave and began to undermine the traditional way of life. What's happening now is that the pace of change is so rapid, it becomes overwhelming. Before, people always felt in control of change. If an idea made sense, they tested it over a long period of time and they adopted it into their culture. But now, everything is just barreling into the villages. And when people lose that sense of control, they lose their sense of dignity and self-reliance. Now let's see if I've got my technology working. Is it on? Okay, great. So you can hear me. Um, and I think I'd like to start from that when they lose their sense of self-control, they lose their sense of dignity uh, and self-worth. Having spent 20 years there, that makes me homesick and want to go back. But you see the isolation that we all live in over there. So tonight I'd really like to use this as a chance for dialogue. Uh, not some expert standing up here in front of you, but just to give you a little bit of an introduction 
of what I see as the razor's edge that we're on over in Ladakh, how close that traditional conservative culture is to being wiped off the planet, and maybe look at some of the reasons behind that, and then have a discussion about what things can be done to save a culture. So since I'm feeling homesick, we're going to go to Ladakh for the next 30 minutes and, and let me see all of my buddies that I'm missing over there having been outside for 10 days. Let me put Ladakh in context and then the change that they're facing in context uh, so that you guys have enough that we can start having questions. The region, as the movie said, is on the westernmost edge of the Tibetan Plateau. Lhasa is far south of us, and we're actually as high as the capital of Tibet. It's sandwiched between the main Himalayan and Karakoram ranges, but very different from both those mountains. Ladakh offers myriad of possibilities to examine questions of people and place, traditions that for millennia have linked culture to the land. There is no separation of culture and land in Ladakh. My job there, working for more than 20 years in international development for both large multilateral agencies as well as grassroots organizations, offers plenty of chances to talk about the happy, sad, and confusing possibilities within international development today, especially as we face modernization and growth development that is often superimposed on cultures without any consideration of the fragile land on which they depend. Ladakh's strategic location, where the political borders of Chinese-controlled Tibet, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan all meet, and where the politics of those nation-states results in the suffering of the Ladakhi people through war after war, offers clear examples of the opportunity costs of, as today's borders pay little attention to history and geography, and instead we get caught up in short-sighted soundbite mentalities. And finally, the title of tonight's talk, The Razor's Edge, provides an image that is appropriate in today's world. From that edge, I can certainly easily slide down into the precipice of, of debilitating doubt that we can ever dig ourselves out of this hole. And just as easily, I can look at the miracles that are created through the aid that we support and claw my way back up the razor's edge in hope on one side, I firmly believe that traditions allow us to live in place. And yet on the other, on a daily basis, I see where traditions restrict positive change. And on one side of the edge, I make my living within the world of development aid and believe that formal and informal commitments to sharing are a moral obligation for all of us. And yet I have seen aid time and time again do more harm than good. And on one side, I am steeped in the teachings of Gandhi and see war as no answer. And yet I struggle to see how we ever will find peace and learn to celebrate differences in South Asia. This edge that I'm on over there in Ladakh has no right answer, no expert opinion, and no clear path and a comfortable place from which to create policy and plan. Tonight, you'll hear me say again and again that the development doesn't work. And equally, you will hear me say again and again that my experience is that when people are fully informed and power is shifted to the passionate of the world, miracle after miracle after miracle occurs. It doesn't work and it's possible. Both are equally true. And we could easily spend the evening just talking about global climate change and its effects on Ladakh, or just talking about what the definition of a traditional culture is, or just talking about war, just talking about aid and its impacts, or just talking about tourism and its impacts. 
But the one expertise I might be able to bring to this forum is that when all of those changes come together, and I think anyone who had high school chemistry and started mixing things against the teacher's instructions knows this, is that when you throw the whole thing together, what you get is unpredictability. And that's the change being faced in the Himalayas today. And one of the other things that is almost certain is that policymakers don't understand unpredictability. They don't plan for it. And so what is happening in development for traditional societies all over the world is that it's development itself is threatening the cultures and threatening the environment on which they depend. So let me start simply by defining what I mean by a traditional conservative society and a little bit of context about the people and the place. Ladakh is a high altitude desert. It's very different from much of the rest of the Himalayas. It is extremely cold in winter and hot in summer with very limited precipitation. It lies on the westernmost edge of the Tibetan Plateau. It starts at 3,500 meters and inhabited spaces go up to 5,200 meters. Being sandwiched between the Himalaya and the Karakoram, it's a crumbly mess of degrading sandstones, not at all like the granite mountains of the Himalayas to the south. It's proudly a part of India, although parts of Ladakh, being lost in wars, are now within Pakistan and Chinese-controlled Tibet. Ladakhis have lived here for over 10,000 years in a very sparse environment. They started as gatherer hunters and now are farmer herders. People depend on a vertical habitation land use system. Valley bottom farmers have downstream woodlots with housing precariously perched on the sides of arable lands. Village to a Ladakhi goes far beyond their fields and their homes though, extending several thousand meters up into the mountains where they have vast grazing lands topped even higher by places where they can collect medicines and biomass. Villages are small and thinly scattered across this rugged terrain. Communication between villages is limited by distance, topography, by the snows of winter and the floodwaters of summer. A traveler is always welcomed and honored. He brings news and excitement and is dependent on the hospitality of the villages he travels through to get from one place to another. Nobody can be independent in Ladakh. The people probably originated from the Middle East, but the history is not really known. As Ladakh lies on important trade routes, genes and ideas from India, Tibet, Mongolia, and the Turkestans have all mixed. Karen Armstrong uses the description traditional conservative society in her very brilliant work, The Battle for God, as a society so steeped in tradition that it is resistant to change. And if you really want to understand fundamentalist reaction to change, I really highly recommend reading her works. Society, its norms, values, and activities focus simply on reproducing itself. Change is more often slow and always locally controlled. There's an emphasis on us over the individual and appeasement over confrontation. <coughs> Traditions are the basis for identity. Conservative is very important to control change. It's not at all a communist society, but depends on extended social groups to plant and to harvest, to ensure important ceremonies and tr transitions, and to raise the children. It is democratic in that every household takes turns serving as a village leader. Whether you're the richest person in the community or the poorest, you must take your turn every 10 or so years serving as the leader. You're the arbitrator and the meeting chair, the voice for the village to dis distant bureaucracy and civil service, and you're always a he, not a she. Generally, women marry into their husband's family and village through arranged marriages, and polyandry was quite common. Households are extended, 
with many generations under one roof. Women are the workers, as usual, largely responsible for both farming and family, yet they experienced much more equality and freedom than in many other South Asia cultures. Families depend on the eldest son and his wife to reproduce. That couple will have up to 14 pregnancies with only three to four children surviving into adulthood. Traditionally, only the eldest married, although brothers could join the marriage later, or siblings can join the monastery or remain part of an extended family as aunties and uncles. It prevented subdivision of precious farming land in villages where unanimous consent is always necessary to bring new lands into cultivation. People depend on the land for everything. And I'm not just talking about food, clothing, shelter, or water, but their very identity is rooted to place. Summer is very busy. Winter is both a time of struggle and a downtime where you can regain strength for the summer to come, both in land and people. The land is also home to the most powerful spirits that control Ladakhi lives. In an environment where water is critically short and fundamental to life, the water spirits are the most powerful entities in the realm of the unknown. But also you will find spirits inhabiting the soil, the rock, and the earth. And they are the controllers, <coughs> not you. The night and the mountains are filled with the Lade, the spirits, ghosts of the dead, and monsters. To them, there is no sense of beauty or benevolence in the environment. Out there is a very, very frightening place. Ladakh is divided into two large districts, the largest in India. Its eastern half is majority Buddhist and Shia and Sunni Muslim in the north and northwestern part. But there are mixed villages throughout both <coughs> districts. Animus spirits exist in both faiths, though they thrive much more in Buddhism and are often incorporated into that religion as demigods to be worshipped. Both the Buddhists and the Muslims have a caste system. Though not as strict as what you see in India, you marry and socialize within your own caste. But all castes are needed to make a village function. There's a very vast difference between <coughs> Societies that develop in really lush, giving, friendly environments, like the people of the Haida Gwaii or the Indonesians, and people who eke out an existence on marginal lands in the world. Indonesians have the time and the resources to invest beauty in great temples that took decades to construct, in their homes, in the smallest items, jewelry or woven cloth, and the epic 24-hour puppet shows that are so common. In lush environments, you also have the critical mass of population that allows you to have an artisan class. <coughs> but in Ladakh, there was not the time or the wealth or the population to highly develop the arts, <coughs> nor support a flourishing thinker-philosopher class. There was a small aristocracy that controls all land and wealth, and a feudal system that existed into the 1960s. Art, thinking, and power were housed with the kings and the monastery. The language was not written until the mid-1800s and then by foreign missionaries. Education was strictly religious until the 1960s with a very small percentage of the aristocracy sending their children outside to education. Song, dance, and art is always traditional and ceremonial. Every move has meaning, and the order of the words is crucially important. Every brushstroke must be painted exactly as your father did, and his father, and his father before him. From art to education to how you plant the fields, the basis is rote memorization and replication of what is already known. In this fragile and frightening land, Life is about replication, not innovation. So what happens to 
this traditional conservative society where all focus is on evolution when you confront the revolution of modernization and the change that we're seeing in our societies today. Let me briefly talk about just four changes that are threatening the culture in Ladakh. Global climate change and war <coughs> and tourism and development and modernization. And please remember that this is change occurring in a place where the majority of the people are still <coughs> illiterate and information is held by a very few people. Something different from what we experience here where all of you guys have such an abundance of access to information, it probably overloads you. And change that Im impacts the environment, and while that's really, really, really important, because the environmental base is so very fragile. It's the cultural context of traditional conservative societies being faced with this change that is really threatening the existence of the people. Quite often, when we look at change, we forget about the people and how they might want to change their futures. And if not forgotten, I've seen large development agencies ignore the wishes of the people and take into consideration that they want. Or where, worse still, it's simply unknown that cultural context is important in international development. Climate change over here <coughs> is a topic you might study in school or something you might see on CNN. Where I live, it's a painful daily reality that is wiping villages off the map. In the past 50 years, Ladakh has lost 50% of its glaciers, and this is in a high altitude desert where we did not have a glacial base that we could afford to lose. In Ladakh, year after year, until recently, we could predict 330 days of clear, sunny weather, and precipitation was minimal. In Ladakh, winters were always cold. Pests could not survive, and ice and snows accumulated over the winter months. And most importantly, Ladakhis depended on the predictable weather patterns seen in the deserts all over the world in order to get a livelihood from the environment. When the snows came, when spring melt occurred, when frost freeze days started and ended, were predictable year after year. The change in the climate, not just warming, but the change in that predictability is devastating Ladakhi culture. Every village is dependent on an irrigation canal system network. The canals tap into the streams, often many kilometers upstream from the village, just where the spring melt will fill them. You don't want them filled in winter, so they tap in right where they know the spring melts always come in June. Now the melt does not come early enough, and it ends just when the maturing crops need the maximum water supply in order to get them through to harvest. The winter snows and glaciers that used to recharge our mountain springs that most villages depend on for safe drinking water are no longer sufficient to do so, and springs all across the region are drying up. The spring dries up, the villagers ration water for a few years and hope things go back to normal. But then they must relocate. But there is no habitable, uninhabited land in Ladakh to relocate to. The mainstay crops of barley, wheat, and peas are frost resistant and fast growing, but they can no longer tolerate June snows that we receive. They lodge with the July rains and rot in the fields during now common August and September <coughs> hailstorms. New pests have arrived with the change. Wheat rust, cutworm, potato fungus, cabbage, cabbage moth, maggots, and aphids were very, very rare. Now they are all common. 
Locust invasions have totally wiped out the crops in southern Ladakh for the last four years running. The architecture that Ladakhis use depends on a desert climate. Houses are now collapsing during prolonged summer rains. Roads, paths, and bridges are all lost in flash floods. Disease pathogens that Ladakhis and their animals have no resistance to are surviving the once bitterly cold winters. Even the way we dress is changing as summers become hot. It touches all aspects of life. It brings the unpredictable into the society that doesn't want it. And of course, the Ladakhis are not the carbon or methane producers of the world. The people don't know about this thing called climate change. Every time I go to one of our villages, the people keep saying things will get back to normal. It's a, it's a black box to them totally. They honestly cannot conceptualize of a world that will change because for hundreds and hundreds of years, the patterns have been that predictable. <coughs> to us, the climate change is very real in its daily manifestations and yet impossible to conceptualize, not just a policy. This is another one that I think to North Americans is a policy that you hear about on CNN or you learn about in school. And again, to us, it's a total reality. The line of control between Pakistan and India runs right through Ladakh. There have been four wars with Pakistan since independence. A free <coughs> Kashmir militancy erupted in 1989 with the imposition of martial law and direct rule on many occasions. This has resulted in a total repression of the Kashmiri people Guerrilla fighting that killed an average of 3,500 people per year for the past one and a half decades and a fundamentalist movement <coughs> that has forced girls from schools, women from employment, and devastated the economy of the region. The more recent war on terror has been a war for terror in South Asia. It has fueled the militancy and fundamentalism. It has entrenched power in the most fanatical and corrupt places, and it has wasted more money and resources than any other policy, concept, idea, or philosophy of the past century. In the 99 war, I personally experienced the immediate devastation of bomb villages, but also saw the long-term road to recovery, with fields having to be demined and debombing going on in the pasture lands. Animals needed to be replaced. Structures and irrigation systems had to be totally rebuilt. But the thing that is really damaging is the distrust between Muslims and Buddhists that has smoldered for years. To this day, a decade later, many of our villages have yet to recover and relationships have not been mended. And the army is very, very popular in Ladakh. Only with the 1962 war was Ladakh connected to the rest of India via a road. The only airstrips in Ladakh were built by the army and now have been open to civilian use. Only with the road came education, healthcare, information, government services, civil society, and goods and trades of the modern world. After losing over a third of Ladakhi territory in the 48 and the 62 wars, India rapidly defends this region. It's a strategic location and they will give anything to maintain it within its boundaries. Ladakhis pay no form of tax. They were granted hill council status and allowed a large degree of autonomy in their governance only because of the wars. And with the army comes a thriving black market. You can buy everything from milk powder to dynamite on that black market brought in by the army. The army also offers a cash income to a population that can't earn money through industry, trade, or civil service. The army is appreciated and revered in Ladakh for what it has brought to the territory. War is not. In a traditional conservative society, 
war only fuels this us versus them paranoid mentality that devastates social cohesion in the villages. There's little room for discussion about this in <coughs> India, and I probably shouldn't say little room. There really is no room for discussion. The escalating fear and irrationality fi fills me really with for foreboding. We're moving towards a mob mentality now that does no cultures anywhere in the world a favor. In a fast-moving mob, there's no thinking, no planning, no careful testing of waters, no discussion. For 65 years, this has been the norm in Ladakh. It's three generations worth of people, and I really fear that we've gone one generation too far to have any kind of discussion. I think maybe in North America, you might wonder how things have spiraled out of control so fast in Pakistan. But again, if you put it in the con context of the traditional conservative societies that live on either side of the line of control, you can see how easy it is to fuel young people with fundamentalist thinking. And that's why it's gotten so crazy so fast over there. Now here's a topic that maybe you can understand not just from CNN, but what you guys live with here in Missoula. And I don't know that for sure. But again, it's not just a, a policy. It's something that devastates a culture unless you can control its impact. Tourism is the forbidden fruit of the underdeveloped world. It's not just an impact that people have on the environment. In fact, I would argue the tourist impact on the environment is by far the least of the worries. The tourist impact on traditional societies is huge. It brings in cravings that didn't necessarily exist there before and trades that are not understood by those societies. The monies that are spent in tourism in Ladakh almost all exit the district. None of it can be tapped into by the people who are bearing the cost of tourism. Resources once invested in the local development are now diverted not to the needs of tourists, but to their wants. We now have a new cast of people that's developed in the 20 years I've been there, the excellencies of the world, and then the rest of Ladakhi society. Tourism did come to Ladakh like a tsunami wave. People started craving things that they saw the tourists had. And people started leaving the villages to enter this chance to, to earn the money to obtain those things. Remember that this was a subsistent agricultural economy that saw very little cash. They didn't need cash. And it only opened its doors to the outside world in 1974, just 40 years ago. <coughs> Drug use, sexually transmitted diseases, thefts, dishonesty, and in are all increasing as tourism becomes entrenched in Ladakh. Where once villagers, visitors who visited us wanted to learn about the traditional culture, and live within the environmental base there, they now demand hot water 25, 24 hours a day, 25 hours a day, and want to take the comforts of home with them on the trekking trail. When I first came to Ladakh, we were seeing somebody needing one donkey for every three people to go into the back country. It's now two horses per one person so that people can have dessert with their lunches. Live chickens are brought so that they can eat meat every night. And they have to have a shower tent. Neither the land nor the culture can sustain that kind of demand. The chadar that you saw in the movie is a vital link that connects Sham, my district, to Stod, or Upper Ladakh. And it has been used for a 1,000 years as the main trade route between the two. Maybe two to three hundred people per year would come out of Sham on the Chadar, but they could bring back the 
goods that served an entire vast territory about a third of the size of the state of Michigan, just two to three hundred people. Now up to 50 tourists per day are visiting the Chatter on what's called thrill-seeking adventure tourism. With their Western demands, they use over five times the amount of resources. This is just one example. This is actually an entire tree pulled up and burned so that the people could have a bonfire one night. Not to cook their food on or anything, they wanted a bonfire for the night. But because Ladakh is such a fragile land, this is the sort of erosion that's happening around the Chatter. The people who serve as the guides for, for tourists on the Chatter must climb up incredibly steep slopes to collect wood. But the people who live there can't climb up those slopes the nuns who need to come out, the children who are going to hospital, and there is no more wood for them to burn as they try to come out. They can't carry enough kerosene to heat their food, and children are dying because they are stranded and can't come out anymore. The result has been a total devastation of the fragile ecosystem along the Chatter. It can no longer so support the people who depend on it, Profits exit the territory, but costs remain. I had to throw in at least one toilet shot just to see if you were still awake. It's not a waste product to us. It's really an important fertilizer that we use in our fields. It's a desert in Ladakh, and night soil was the one fertility we could add back into our kitchen gardens. But a law was passed in the year 2000 that if you had a registered guest house or hotel, you had to install a flush toilet in a desert. There was no water available. So our government, in all of its wisdom, took 40 crore rupees, or twice the annual budget for all government services for the entire district, and spent it on a lifting scheme to bring water to lay town so that people could flush toilets. The pipes break on an annual basis. Most people steal water from agricultural allotments so people could flush toilets. This has resulted in small water wars and almost nobody has a septic tank so the water goes directly back into surface canals and the surface canals either go to restaurants where, people, where dishes are washed or into kitchen gardens where people grow the food that we eat. Hepatitis A is now endemic, amoebic dysentery is the norm, and cholera and other dangerous, dangerous communicable diseases that Ladakhis have no resistance to are making headway into the culture. The same is true for investment in electricity, health care, roads, decisions that are now tempered on how it will benefit the 30,000 tourists who visit the region for a few short weeks each year. While 250,000 indigenous people who are wholly dependent on the land for their survival are left out of the planning process. And to me a really sad footnote on this is that the advertisements I have seen in the West tout all this as eco or culturally friendly tourism. And maybe these are just beliefs we want to cling on to, to evade the truth of what really lies behind tourism. That all tourism is going to have negative impacts and the negative impacts are felt by the people, not the tourists. Only in Bhutan and Burma, in all of South Asia, has the government made locally friendly tourism laws. I've watched in Ladakh as it's created a growing schism between the haves and the have-nots. In the center, the capital city of Leh, people's whole lives are now wrapped up in getting money off the tourist trade. <coughs> And that's where all the development is invested. There's a quasi-periphery, the trekking routes that people go out on, where people beg sponsorships off tourists, but at least can get some of the cash from the tourists for their villages. 
And then there's a huge periphery that sees absolutely no benefit whatsoever from tourism. The Shangri-La concept only further damages the results of tourism there. That we want people to stay <coughs> in preserved in the traditions that we think exist on the Tibetan Plateau and don't want them to change at all. Again, development and change might just be a policy here, but for us, it's something that we live. And the damaging results of large bilateral development <coughs> funding has huge negative impacts on a traditional non-cash economy society. Ladakh receives more development aid per capita than any other district in India. It's mostly funneled through 52 NGOs and 30 additional registered societies, <laughs> which means there's one development agency for every 1,500 Ladakhis. And you better bet that in the Dar of Islams that you see in uh, Slum Dog Millionaire, there isn't one development agency for every 1,500 people. The annual NGO budget far exceeds what is available through the government, so power shifts from the government, who will always be there, to NGOs that come and go like the wind. Ladakh is half Buddhist and half Muslim, but 90% of all aid is invested in Buddhist regions and projects. Project scope is also defined by development fashion, not necessarily the local needs. In the 12 years since we founded Health Inc., we've watched 19 huge campaigns about AIDS. In that same time, we have only had three health campaigns on sanitation and hygiene. Village coverage is similar. If there is no road to your village, chances are you do not have an NGO working there. And the same goes for minority populations. 75% of the NGOs in Ladakh spend 60% or more of their time and 33 to 50% of their resources in the capital city of Leh, where only 6% of the population lives and the wealthiest percent of Ladakh for sure. Government aid, much of which is loans through the World Bank and highly constrained by uh, sorry, structural readjustment mentalities, is largely invested in nationwide five-year plans. And I think from the slides, you figured out that nationwide five-year plans, what's good for India, does not necessarily match what we need in Ladakh. Most of Ladakh's development money is spent on road construction, watershed development, and power generation. In Sham, the territory where I work, the budget for road maintenance is as high as that for road construction. And yet no allotment was made in original development projects to provide for maintenance. So the government has taken all those funds from the education budget and shifted them in to maintaining roads that had no business being built there in the first place. Ill-conceived projects by both civil society and government have wasted vast amounts of money and resources while also creating a dependency on aid in the region. It's one of the biggest growth industries in all of India and certainly in Ladakh. And with the push to meet the Millennium Development Goals, the pressure has been on to spend, spend, spend recently. I now have to go back to my Canadian partner and try to explain to them why I'm returning money because I couldn't spend it. And basically, the agencies who gave me the money in the first place would rather see me spend it than justify why it needs to be turned back in, no matter what the outcome of the project is. For example, to meet the Millennium Development Goals, which one of the goals says that every child should have access to quality primary education by the year 2015, we had to build a lot of new schools in Ladakh. <laughs> However, the plans for our schools have to match the state requirement. Most of our state is very hot and wet. 
So we had to build schools to keep out the heat and to keep off the rain. But we don't get much rain in Ladakh, and we certainly don't get much heat. So the end result of the building design is that it's too dark and cold for the children to use for seven months of the year. And it certainly isn't a motivating factor to get teachers to show up for work. In a drive to reduce India's horrifically high mother mortality rates, it was decided that all women should deliver in hospital. But in Ladakh, you're lucky if the one hospital is only a nine hour bus ride away, and chances are it's more like a three day walk. We only have one gynecologist, and she just recently finished training. So the outcomes are not necessarily that optimal in the hospital yet. And what happens to the woman's children who are left at home while she leaves the home for 60 days to deliver? And finally, in talking about development, I'd like to just briefly touch on Millennium Goals number seven and eight. To ensure environmental sustainability by the year 2015, and to develop a global partnership for development, which means that all nations will contribute 0.7% of GDP towards development by the year 2015. To be quite frank, we haven't a clue what to do to achieve these two development goals in Ladakh. With climate change, it feels impossible to plan for that change. And with the desire for every Indian to own a vehicle, to own a television, to join the cash economy, to send their child to private school, <coughs> we wouldn't be able to grow the economy enough to achieve those kind of personal development goals. We really don't know how change is going to impact the environment. And we certainly don't know if we'll have a viable culture by the year 2015 as we attempt modernization. And yet, vast amount of monies are still being poured into the district under the title of sustainable development that espouses ecological soundness. This one example, this is a $90 million project over a 10-year period that resulted in the installation of one large solar power generation facility that served one large village. The $90 million is the same as the budget for our entire district for 20 years. The project worked for four years, and now again, the village is without lighting. And what happened to the other 240 villages in Ladakh that were not included in the scheme that never did get lighting. So we can return to this one because on the one hand, I really believe that we should all work towards the Millennium Development Goals. And yet on the other hand, I think they're being driven by policymakers that haven't got a clue about how to have sustainable development in the world. A brief story of how we started HealthInc. I was the country director for a small international development agency that had a big, big European Union budget. While working, I discovered some incredibly poor project management and some outright theft of funds, and I asked that the projects be shut down until we could work the kinks out of the system and then restart the project in a more sustainable way. The patron of the NGO that I worked for was and is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The board and I called a meeting with him to seek his advice on what sh we should do about these projects that were in such trouble. We described the issues to him and he thought about it for a long time. And he made this statement that has stayed with me for the past 12 years. He said, I know you Westerners mean well but you often do more harm than good. Don't give my people any more aid. They don't need it. Go spend your life 
trying to do more good than harm. So HealthInc was born out of that meeting and that sentence that I would never forget, go spend your life trying to do more good than harm. And that brings us to about the only positive thing you're going to hear out of me tonight, which is the really exciting, challenging, inspirational, fun, frustrating, neat, cool, cutting edge, and at least somewhat optimistic work that we're doing within Health Inc. The last 12 years of my work in India has focused on ways that development really can support a traditional society as it faces rapid, confusing, dispiriting change. From being the country di director, I returned to Ladakh and formed teams of interns who were school dropouts from remote villages. They had dreamt of getting an education, but mostly because of financial constraints, they had to drop out and take care of their families. We would go to the villages and test new ideas and our beneficiaries became total project partners alongside us, joined us in the experiment, and agreed to test things and not be afraid of failures as well as successes. We had a rule. We only worked in villages where other NGOs didn't go and government services were lacking. We had another rule that said we worked with every single house in the village, not just the people who could we're usually wealthy, and those are the ones who can access funds from development agencies. We targeted the women in the villages, and I think almost all international development does target women now. But whether they were young or old or educated or not, and whatever caste they were, we asked all of the women in the village to sign a three-year contract in order to create community development. If one head, woman head of household refused to sign the contract, we'd leave the village and let the women discuss it until they could agree that development should be equally shared with all. We stayed in each village for up to three years so that we had plenty of time to proceed slowly and carefully, and there was lots of time for everyone to learn. And people do really learn at different paces and they really needed to go slowly so that everyone could catch up and feel comfortable with change. Our interns came to us from those remote villages and the women really felt comfortable with them. They weren't fancy city folks, but the language in Ladakh, you know exactly what village you come from by how you speak. And so the women knew that these people are just like us. They understand our problems and we can talk to them. Everything was self-help. Everything, everything, everything was self-help. There was no charity within the system. People would grumble and moan and complain because remember with the army there, things were coming free from the government. Well, why the heck did they have to contribute so much by working with us. But they would really engage and start thinking about careful use of resources and the joy that they experienced when they succeeded. You could tell it was their joy, it wasn't ours. It really, really belonged to them. And we always linked the women directly with the government offices that were supposed to be providing the services in the first place, but they wouldn't walk out to these remote villages. So the women knew where all the offices were located, they knew the men, and they got their phone numbers. And they never would let go. If the guy made a promise and didn't keep it, the women would pester him until it was easier to meet government obligations than to deal with these growing powerful women. Leadership is something that we still struggle with. It's a painful step-by-step-by-step -step -step process. But we made sure that leadership came directly from the villages, not within our agency, but within the kids from the village, so that it would always stay there and it would move on to the next generation. We stayed small, we stayed fast, we stayed flexible, we stayed resilient, 
and we questioned everything. And most importantly, we stayed poor. If the villages didn't help, it wasn't going to happen. We never allowed our budget to grow. We still remain, this year actually we have 16,000 US dollars and we service 250,000 people. Our matching grants are at least nine to one, at least nine to one, and we're the only agency in Ladakh that can achieve that. And sometimes things worked, and it's the most amazing things that worked. And sometimes things didn't work. <laughs> These are Cynthia's cheap tours, guys. This is what happens to the volunteers who come over and help me. Interestingly, when I was doing my year-end evaluations this year and going out to the villages alone, so it can just be woman to woman discussing issues and the women deciding where they want to go with the next year. I returned through one of the villages who had graduated from our program in 2006. And the day that I arrived, the women were in riotous mood, putting the final touches on the women's center that they had started to build themselves in 2006. This is 2008, that they were just finishing it. And whitewash was flying everywhere, and floors were being swept, and carpets were being laid and doors were being hung, all by the women and their children, and tea and jokes were flowing freely. And they said, you know, you might be disappointed that it's over two years since we laid the first brick and we're just now finishing our women's center, but we're not in the least bit disappointed. Three years within the program, taught us an awful lot, but we still had a bunch of infighting that we had to go through and a bunch of maturing in order to learn how to work together. You gave us the time to do all of that infighting and to do all of that maturing so that we can work together now. And the quote that they gave me for the evaluation was, it didn't matter what we actually did in those three years. It mattered about the self-confidence we gained so that we can do things now and we can keep doing them tomorrow. And I reflected about that the whole day and I really realized that our programs are not just about building greenhouses or building a women's center or getting a wheelchair into a village for a disabled one. It's that self-confidence that doesn't get incorporated into many development programs that was making the difference between ours and others. Development faces an awful lot of challenges as we get more money and move closer to the Millennium Development Goals deadlines. A couple of beliefs that I really hold to are, first, it must be based on a fully informed public. And again, I go back to the context that in a traditional conservative society, information was held by less than 1% of the aristocracy at the top of that society. So that you could spend decades just getting people informed. And agencies don't spend decades getting information out to every single person in the village. They think short term, they want to have the greenhouse built, so that by the end of the year, they can turn in the report to the funding agencies that says we constructed X amount of buildings, not how many people they were building. It must be locally driven and target the needs and work within societal norms. This is kind of like saying it must be grassroots development. And I think everybody in every proposal uses those words but I very rarely see true grassroots development out in the real world. It's not locally driven. There's usually a leader at the top, not a flat management structure, 
who is making the decisions on behalf of the villagers, and that's not sustainable. It's not going to leave anything behind when they leave. And speaking of leaders, development has to be based on excellent leadership, and the leadership has to come from the village itself, not the development agency. There can't be coercion, but rather inspiration. Again, the aristocracy were the leaders in Ladakh. The last thing they want to do is relinquish power to the villagers. And the mischievous part of me is that I love it when I see young people like these 15-year-olds who get to battle our government and our aristocracy and win. Development should target two areas that are the basis for all human development, health and education. Forget the rest. Forget the rest. Forget the rest. Almost all international development e money goes into economic growth it's a total washout. If you provide for health and education, the proper economic development, uh, economic growth will come from the people themselves. By investing in economic growth, we're only supporting our Western economies and our Western needs. And while development must target the most marginalized in socii society, the most marginalized in these societies are often the most resistant to change, and they're the most unprepared for change. Think of the women who started building the center in 2006 and didn't complete it until 2008. In the soundbite mentality that we have now, we don't want to deal with marginalized because they take a long time. It's slow going. <coughs> but if we don't deal with the marginalized, those are the people who are going to become fundamentalists. You're pushing them away from modernization, and you're pushing them right into the hands of fundamentalists all over the world. And by dealing with the most marginalized, it brings me full circle. What they need is access to information. And as soon as they become informed, they start making much better decisions, and they start taking risks. And then you base it on local norms, and you base it on wonderful local leadership and building those leaders. And it's interesting what we've learned working together over the past 12 years in Health Inc. and the more than 25 years since I first moved to Asia about change in a conservative society. On one hand or on one side of the razor's edge, we have this unpredictable change where war is coming together with global climate change, is coming together with development aid, which is coming together with the rapidly growing tourism in Asia. And on the other hand, or the other side of the razor's edge, we have that traditional conservative society that probably has very, very different goals than what we believe in in terms of change. And in the middle, we've given all the decision-making power to international development aid to determine what kind of change we're going to have happen. And the policymakers within international development aid have clearly proven that they don't understand unpredictability and they can't create policy for it. They are so slow moving. It's like the Titanic heading towards the iceberg. Unpredictability means you have to be resilient and fast thinking and big organizations don't tend to be that way. And we've given all the power to these people to make decisions who are not from traditional conservative societies. They're not from the villages. How can they possibly make decisions on behalf of the 75% of Indians who live in villages or are dependent on rural economies if they've never seen a village and they don't understand those rural economies? And sitting here, we can feel a little bit overwhelmed by the challenges we face, whether it's in Missoula or Ladakh. Challenges of war and peace, and what can I do to change it? Challenges about environmental sustainability or development and growth, and what can I do to change it? For 20 years, I've had this kind of moldy little scrap of paper in my wallet that I carry with me everywhere. They're my mantras that give me peace and direction in life. And the first one is from Margaret Mead, and a real favorite of mine. 
It says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful people could change the world. Of course, indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. The second little piece is a part of a couplet from Goethe that says, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. So I think we should take the concept of hope. This is the emblem that the disabled girls created for their ability network, where they're bringing the only cash, a bunch of disabled girls are bringing the only cash economy into their villages. And the rewa at the top means hope. So to take those ideas of hope with us into the discussion now and talk about ways that you can make change fit conservative societies and working with thoughtful people create a little bit of magic that really will change the world. Thanks so much. And the really good news is that I said no taking notes during that. So the paper that you have to write for class is just going to be on this discussion. And I, oh, look, she's shaking her head. No, no, I was taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> and I would really hope that we could make it a forum because I'm all alone over there, and I'd like to hear your guys' opinions, because it really does mean a lot to me. What do you mean by the being opened up and making something work? What happened? Uh, it was because of where it is on the line of control, it was closed to tourism, and Westerners were not allowed to go there until 1974. So it's just this generation of people People my age over there grew up without any contact with the outside world whatsoever. And the road that came in 62, it doesn't mean people went outside. Most people my age have never left the territory. Yeah. So it the off to the area with deep religious roots. I'm sure you encountered some um, religious boundaries, like maybe not offending spirits or some other things? How did you deal with these boundaries? What were some of the boundaries? Um, a lot of them make so much sense that I wouldn't live it any other way and our programs wouldn't go any other way. Like the Lu, the spirit of the water. Well, water is so precious that you can't ever afford to pollute the water in your village. And you therefore honor the loo, and you don't, um, there's no toilets near the spring. You can never pour water back into the spring. Your hands have to be clean before you approach the spring, those sorts of things. So those religious beliefs fit really well. There are some, and it's actually more of the Buddhist beliefs that we face issue with than the Muslim beliefs there. Um, the Buddhists have a policy of not killing anything. And they have recently decided that that extends to using family planning. Um, and this is just, just the Buddhist where I am. This is not necessarily anything that flows into Tibetan Buddhism or Buddhism in India. And so therefore, women should no longer access family planning and they can no longer plan their families so that they're having too many pregnancies and our mother mortality rate is going up and our infant mortality rate is going up and there we have to try to inform oh and by the way the policies are all male led and they're middle class males whose wives had their tubes tied years ago yeah there's a bit of a contradiction there 
So we try to inform those people that women ha and their husbands have a right to choose and that that's just as much a part of Buddhism and you have to take as good a care of the last child as the first child. So on issues like that, we try to inform first rather than confront. And if that doesn't work, we try to build the self-confidence at the village level where people will make decisions for themselves and not be dictated to by religious leaders. What is His Holiness think of family planning? His Holiness says that, I wish you could ask him and not me, I don't want to speak for him, um, that you have to take as good a care of your last child as your first and that abortion is a sin, but that family planning is a part of care for women and children that's a part of our modern world. I mean, quite honestly, I think this is more about the Muslims are reproducing faster than the Buddhists, therefore us and them type stuff, and we got to have more babies than them. It's, it, it's not based on sound information. You're from Canada, correct? Um, Canada's home. I was raised in the States. They have, well, even with Canada or the United States, we have Native Americans living here, right? Mm hmm Don't you see that their culture, the vote for your, you know, place, you see that the, the culture is being broken down to, to, and it's the same as what's happening over there. Well, but back here in Montana, I'm Cheyenne. I'm fighting to save our language, fighting to save our culture. And I just, you know, I don't understand uh, the importance of You know, I do understand that part, but to hurry up and try to save theirs? Well, what about the people here in the United States? What about the natives here that we need to save their, their language? We need to take their traditions too. I absolutely agree with you. And I think there are traditional societies all over the world that are being swept aside. And it's interesting because our, we're linking our young people with young Aboriginal people, First Nations people in Alberta. Because when they start talking to each other, it's amazing the common issues and the solutions, or at least discussions, that happen back and forth between these young people who are the future, you know, who, whose hands it is in to save threatened cultures everywhere. I understand exactly what you're saying, but see, the natives are probably gone through the changes. We've gone through the adaptations of what, you know, we have to have just to survive. So it's kind of important that, you know, we should focus on the native side that have already gone through that part and then, you know, to help these others so they won't have to make the same mistakes. And again, I think, I think there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of value in that and I would guess that it would have a larger impact than a rich white society person coming over and saying, oh, we made a whole bunch of mistakes about polluting the environment and we don't want you to make them either. Because the mistakes that we made were not painful and didn't threaten our culture. It threatened somebody else's cultures. But the, the modernization that First Nations people went through did threaten their culture and did almost wipe them off the planet and they didn't necessarily control it. So I think in those sorts of exchanges, there's a tremendous amount of value. Peer-to-peer, -peer, even across cultures, works brilliantly. Let's see, let me go back there and then I'll come to the front. Way at the back. And you might have to yell because I only hear you from this side. Um, you mentioned that uh, in order to save the value of the earth, there should be a focus on funding health and education. Do you feel that economic development is going to be able to save the value of the earth here in Canada? Uh, 
Economic development is different from economic growth. Um, that's the first thing. Um, I don't, you know, I stopped growing. I'm just a believer that I'm still developing, but I'm not growing. Um, uh, my, here's my big fear, is that satellite television has come to India, and there's 1.1 billion people who want a vehicle, and who want television, and who want refrigeration, and wouldn't mind having power, you know, electricity in their homes. So I think the economic development that a lot of the underdeveloped world is going to want is not sustainable at all. And um, there's not going to be any way that you're going to stop that kind of development from happening. <coughs> Can we have sustainability without having a total crash in the environment? Look at the banking system. You know, can we have sound policy without going through a crash? I would, um, I guess I'd say no. And it's your generation that needs to deal with this issue because I'll be long dead. So maybe there's more optimism in the room. Can we have economic development that's sustainable? Anyone want to offer an opinion? <laughs> there were some raised eyebrows and rolled eyes. I if we don't, we're toast, right? So I guess we need to aim towards that target. And, and, but you got to work. I have a question about the other international aid organizations, or the other aid organizations. I understand you're local, but uh, having seen your success there in Ladakh, um, has anyone said, oh, well, teach us uh, what you're doing and why you're having this success at the community level and when we aren't? I guess it depends upon how you define success, because those people have vehicles, and we don't, and they have posh offices, and we don't, and they never have to walk out to the villages. So I think they see themselves as more successful than we are, because we got to go out and do all that hard work, and nobody questions how they spend the money. Okay, so, um, so do you have do you have a book or a, a some kind of course that you could possibly offer to those uh, other aid uh, agencies? to teach them what you're doing, what you, what you showed us a little bit about tonight? Um, it, the, the course that we have is, for instance, I just came from one of our projects that's run by 10 dropouts, um, all of them illiterate, who left school, and they're running development programs in their home villages for us now. And I think those are the graduates of our craziness. And those are the kind of people that we really hope carry it forward, because then, boy, change can come. And the aristocracy that controls development and the money and the power can't resist a whole herd of good development like that. Uh, the, the larger agencies don't change. I think in India you will find in most districts, in small villages, small organizations doing wonderful things. And it would be lovely if we could have a forum where the small agencies could get together and talk. We have time for one more question. I wonder uh, what kind of innovation you're seeing within the communities. Uh, uh, facing all these challenges we're talking about, especially climate change. Um, how are people responding either in terms of their agricultural practices or their uh, decision-making practices, um, cultural views, anything like that? I mean, I'm interested to hear how that's going. Could have asked an easy question for the last one. 
Um, two things. First, it really, well, I don't know, maybe it's not understood here, but especially the women who are responsible for the farming, um, they really don't believe that the change is permanent. And they keep saying, it'll get better. And we don't want to make change. I mean, we really don't want to make change because you grow up memorizing this system and you don't, you can't critically think of how to adjust the system. So next year will be okay. We'll just survive this year and next year will be okay. So that's one very serious issue that you have to convince people it's a whole new world and you do have to change and make adjustments. Uh, what we've done is we've put model farms at different altitudes for different ideas and are trying to use indigenous crops that are more resilient, that are drought resistant or more frost resistant, um, look at different ways of local organic pest control and things like that. And the women run our farms for us. And then we have forums where we bring other vill village women to that place so women can teach women new techniques that might work. And, and then with the unpredictability, it's drought this year and it's floods next year. So you start all over again. That's one thing. Uh, the, the biggest issue though is relocation of people. And the island nations are going to have to do this. The, there's, Bangladesh is going to have to do this. So where do you, if your spring dries up, you have to move. And do you break the village up and they go to other villages which don't, which are also suffering from drought so they can't take any more people in. And we don't have slums, urban slums yet, but that's what you see elsewhere in India, is that people have to migrate off the land into city centers. And th then you get back to that economic growth question. So it's, it's a really, really, really tough one. And I think our model farms for the women are the only thing that we've come up with that might address it. And if change slows down, which maybe it won't, we'll be okay. With that, let's really thank you. Thank you.